broadcasting, and you're on the air over there. Okay, uh, we're ready to go. So it tells Leah to start the machine. Uh, Leah, I guess you're supposed to start the machine. Welcome to Think Tech Radio's Focus on Asia Tuesday. Today's in review with your host, international business lawyer, David Day. Well, good afternoon. And we have got a uh, very exciting program for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Vietnam and doing a business update. And we're very pleased to have as our special guest here in the studio with us uh, downtown here in uh, the belly of the beast, downtown Honolulu here. Uh, Ms. Sarah Kemp, the Senior Commercial Officer for the U.S. Commercial Service from Hanoi, Vietnam. So Sarah, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. David, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I had, I had the pleasure of meeting Sarah in Hanoi, and uh, she is uh, one of the, uh, I, I don't want to denigrate you by calling you a rising star, but uh, somewhere between rising and superstar within the U.S. Commercial Service uh, in Asia, and Sarah has served a uh, previous post uh, in China, and, and where else in the region have you been? China, including Beijing and Hong Kong, uh, Beijing twice, and also in Thailand. So this is the, the big lady uh, for uh, U.S. Commercial Service in Vietnam, and she is responsible for uh, the entire marriage broker business that the U.S. Commercial <laughs> Service does with, with U.S. business in Vietnam, and that includes uh, in the South, I know you have other officers in the South, but uh, they are, they report to you, do they not? We do. We have two operations, one in the North in Hanoi and one in the South, and hopefully we're making long-lasting marriages that last forever <laughs> between U.S. We companies. We like those kind of marriages, right. And Vietnamese businesses. Well, you know, Sarah, let's, uh, for our audience here, maybe many do not know uh, a lot about kind of the current economic and business milieu in, uh, in Vietnam at the moment. Let's, let's give the audience kind of a, a, an overview. Uh, some of the folks are, are driving home in rush hour and some are listening on the internet on the mainland or, or uh, uh, in Asia. Um, what does the, the Vietnamese economy look like today? Sure. Well, you know, historically it's been a high growth region. It's, it's achieved 7% for a decade or right. more. Uh, and currently, the snapshot right now is not as bright. It's only 5% growth rate. But you're talking about a population of 90 million. And really, I think the success story of Vietnam is how much it has changed in a very short period of time. It has an up-and-coming middle class, so receptivity to fast-moving consumer goods or franchises is, is very well, um, well received. Uh, you also have a lot of a, a good play for infrastructure. There's about 200 billion, and that's with a B, in overseas development assistance that's going to go into Vietnam over the next 10 to 15 years to help develop its infrastructure. So Vietnam has a lot of need at the moment. The, the question is really, how do you finance that? And Vietnam, partly because of the world economic crisis, is, is really facing a, a cash crunch. Okay, okay. Uh, so on the negative side uh, of what's happening right now, uh, Vietnam has to restructure its economy. It's, it's a centrally planned economy still. Uh, you have a lot of state-owned enterprises that uh, account for about 40 percent of the GDP but take about 70 percent of the resources. So very inefficient use of capital going on. You have non-performing loans in the banking sector. No one really knows what they are. And as, as you well know, you're more of an expert at this than I am, so I'll let you jump in. About 20 percent. Well, that's the, the published government figure of 20 percent. And, and we all know that, that uh, it could be quite a bit higher. It, it could be. Um, they've done Vietnam, the government of Vietnam is, is really focusing on stability over growth this year. They've done a very good job on their monetary policy of bringing inflation in line. When you were there last, I think inflation was double digit. That's and, right. and now it's down down to 7 and 8 percent. That's, that's, that's a cool. remarkable improvement. It is, it is. So it's a mixed bag. Well, you know, Sarah, one of the things that I, I think that, that many people are, are asking themselves as they're, as they're listening to this program is, what, what is the, the attitude that, the, the, that Vietnamese have towards Americans sure. in the, you know, the aftermath of this terrible conflict that we had in Southeast Asia sure. quite some time ago? Sure, and we get this a, a lot. I get this question a lot uh, because of, of the Vietnam War legacy issue. 
Um, interestingly enough, it really is an American issue and not a Vietnamese issue. I mean, it's um, American baggage. It is, it is. The Vietnamese, when I talk to some of my friends, Vietnamese friends, they, they explain it this way. Uh, Vietnam had about 2,000 years of the Chinese invading every 200 years. Okay. And there is uh, not a lot of love lost between those two. In fact, there, <laughs> there is mounting... That's putting it very that, delicately. <laughs> well, we are on public... Uh, we are on radio, right? So I... Um, <laughs> And then they had the French that came in with more extractive colonialization. And then you have the Americans. And the Americans, as they said, it was a civil war and you picked the wrong horse. Okay. So okay. There, there's not that same kind of animosity that uh, exists certainly towards the Chinese or even, even towards the French. You know, related to this topic and then coming back into business is, is an interesting fact. Uh, I think you were telling me that, that, that there's an enormous percentage of the Vietnamese population today are born after the 76 fall of Saigon actually yeah 70%. 70 percent it is a very young dynamic population which it's one of the market drivers I mean when you look at Vietnam as a place to do business it's, again why are fast-moving consumer goods why are Pepsi and Coke having a very good return because it's a young population and uh, companies can get in we've had some very very good success stories of companies getting in uh, and developing a brand and creating a buzz about a brand because there hasn't been a history of other brands in that in that space. Um, but yes, there is a very young population and highly, uh, relatively educated. Although there is some challenges in terms of the skill set that they come out of the schools and colleges with sure. and what multinationals need in, in terms of workforce matching. You know, one of the interesting things about Vietnam's background is that you have this connection with China so there's a, there's a large long border long yeah. border and also you know goods being purchased from China mm -hmm. and then you have the European connection with the French and then you have the Russian connection <laughs> uh, and then there certainly is an American connection there and it's interesting that the what is the view of that the Vietnamese have towards uh, American business or goods that are produced in the United States it's very positive, very, very positive, partly because a lot of the machinery, Otis Elevators is, you know, one of their big success stories is those elevators worked even after the, after the war. And, and some of the, the equipment that was used during the war, again, w worked through the embargo, through the whole time when we did not have normalized relations with Vietnam. Their durability, the quality. Also, in, in Vietnam in particular, um, because of some of their food scares, they and right. because there's not a robust uh, consumer protection uh, enforcement or law or even uh, organizations that really protect the consumer, in a lack of consumer protection, the the local Vietnamese are going to look at foreign brands and U.S. brands to provide that. So there is still um, it is a very price sensitive market, but there still is a willingness to have a little bit of a premium, not a lot, but a little bit of a premium to get that kind of comfort. What's the, the current kind of the current status of the relationship between the United States and Vietnam you know, on the, the governmental or military sure. relationship? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because it really is a very positive story and it, it keeps getting better and better. Um, last summer we had Secretary of Defense Panetta come. Mm -hmm. We have um, ship visits that come and do doctor visits. So you have U.S. military ship visits. Was it doing U.S. Mercy and others? Yes, exactly. U.S. Mercy was there uh, doing hospital uh, ship visits. So it's getting uh, more uh, collaboration. Uh, in my own shop, from a commercial perspective, last month we did the first ever in history since we normalized relations hmm. commercial military sales seminar with the Ministry of Defense. It was unheard of. It was unprecedented. This is a business. It's like, this like business. A it's about selling, you know, Sikorsky. Yeah, they sell some helicopters and some radar systems. Um, and it, it, we got an unbelievable turnout. And not only did we get a turnout, you can appreciate this, they stayed after lunch, right? They stayed to the very end, which is, <laughs> which is one way that well, okay, I know it's okay, successful. Okay. So. All right, let's, let's flip it around now. What, what, is, what is, you know, what is the Vietnam's relationship with, with China? You, you mentioned this, this long, uh, violent history and uh, kind of the, the uh, to put your comments in, in, in something so that our, our listeners can picture this, what you're saying is that it's, it's kind of the relationship of uh, uh, lips and teeth with China being the, the teeth and, and Vietnam being the lips. They're so close, something like that. Yeah. You gotta yes. be careful you don't get bitten. 
The, it, very true. It's a very good analogy. I mean, Vietnam walks a tightrope between the U.S. on one side and the China, China on the other. Uh, again, they have they are integrated with both economies. As you mentioned, they purchase about 15 billion, 16 billion of, of uh, products from China. That that is about the same amount that they sell to the U.S. They're balancing that tightrope very carefully, <laughs> right to the dollar. Yeah, pretty pretty well balanced. <laughs> Um, and uh, there is obviously there are historical ties with Russia, but there is there is a sort of an ideological tie with with the mainland with with communism in both countries, um, and they they also have uh, you know issues in terms of the South East uh, South China Sea or the Eastern Sea, in terms of the Spratly Islands and and neighbor relations. So Vietnam is put in a very difficult position of walking that tightrope between both the U.S. and China, and I, I have to give them. Kudos. I think they're doing a very good job of trying to balance it, trying to understand how can they engage further in the world economy. You see that with their willingness to engage on TPP and some of the other uh, multilateral trade agreements that they're trying to conclude. Um, but they're also doing it on their own terms, and they're trying to figure out how to keep it on their own terms. All right. Well, separate from the attitude of the government mm -hmm. and the, the relationships between the Vietnamese government and, and, the, and China, as an example. What are the what are the attitudes of, of, of the people, the Vietnamese people, towards the Chinese? Well, if you read the news, there are, there are a lot of protests that come about uh, against China. Um, not a lot, but but some. So I think there is a there is an uneasy um, acceptance, maybe, that they they are neighbors to the north. Uh, but again, there an is the long uneasy acceptance. There is a long history, um, and you know, if you go back and you look at Vietnam, if you want to really study Vietnamese history before the French came in and phonicized the language, it was Chinese characters. So when you're in Vietnam and you go to the temples, mm. there are Chinese characters in the temples. Um, so there is a long history between China and Vietnam, and, and I think that plays out with Vietnam wanting to assert itself as its own independent country. And, and that's something that's something that the U.S. government is very supportive of. We want an independent, successful Vietnam. You know, before we uh, go to the break here, I just want to tell you a quick little uh, story that kind of summarizes this whole piece in that uh, I, was, I was looking, uh, doing some Christmas shopping on Dong Khoi Street uh, last year. And uh, this is the, for the listeners, this is where a lot of the, the high-end retailers, but also some, some high-end tourist, tourist craft shops are in Ho Chi Minh City. And I walked into this little store, and they had these little cute little teddy bears for sale. And the teddy bears had a tag on them. And the tag said, all of the products that were used to make this teddy bear come from Vietnam, and none of the products came, come from China. China. Well, there is. There's been a lot of scare, scares, particularly in the food chain, uh, from products from from mainland China. And so, uh, where this benefits U.S. companies, we've we've had a huge increase in high-end fruits. So whether it's Washington apples or pears or cherries, um, people are willing to pay to make sure that the food they they eat is not tainted. And again, there's been some unfortunate food um, scandals in particular. There's a lot of fakes in Vietnam. Unlike China, they're not manufactured there. They're all coming from, um, or many are coming from, from China. These are like the fake DVDs? Fake DVDs, purses, mm -hmm. brake pads, okay. pharmaceuticals. iPads. iPads, you know, you name it. Uh, a lot of it is coming across the border. And Vietnam is trying to deal with that. In some cases, in my personal opinion, they're enacting policies that really sort of cut their nose to spite their face. They had. Uh, a decree called 197 that uh, constrained all the high-end luxury goods, so cosmetics, um, distilled spirits, iPads, to being flown into three different um, ports. Okay. Uh, so it was limiting how these high-end luxury goods could come in. You know, de facto, I think that was probably to try to stop the the, the illegal trade and the, the fake trade from China, but it didn't really do that. It, did, it had no effect on the, the fakes, it and it really added, just, added two it just more constrained. Ports. Yeah, it just constrained the, the legal. They have since rolled that back and 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 gotten gone away with that. But in many cases, you see some of the policy making being done as a reaction to. You know, one of the things we want to get into in the program here, ladies and gentlemen, is we want to talk about 
uh, and we'll get into the specifics of business, but we want to talk about Vietnam as a, as a regional player, so you have the, the, the big picture. And we'll do that after the break, so stay with us. Seven sixty KGU, part of the Wall Street Business Network. Just one new accident is reported. It's in Manoa Valley on East Manoa Road at Oahu <laughs> Avenue. Watch for malfunctioning traffic lights at North Kuakini and Lanikila Avenue, and over on the windward side at Kahikili Highway and Kulake Oi Street. No problems coming over from the windward side from. The background of where Vietnam sits uh, in terms of its uh, economy today, its relationship with the United States, which is, uh, according to Cara, is, Sarah, is just superb, and, uh, and also its relations, a delicate relationship, uh, tight walk, as I think uh, Sarah put it, with, uh, with China. And uh, right before the break, Sarah, you mentioned the, the term T TPP, TPP, the yeah. Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, and this is an important uh, development that uh, all of you in the business community need to know about. Uh, it's coming down the home stretch in terms of its uh, finalization. And so, Sarah, what is this Trans Pacific Partnership all about, and how does Vietnam fit into this? Sure, no, I, I 
Thank you for that question, because I think there's a very interesting regional play uh, to Vietnam, not just its own market of, of 90 million, but the Trans-Pacific Partnership, quite briefly, is a multi-country trade agreement that's being currently negotiated with 12 countries, and those countries are Australia, Brunei, Chile, Malaysia, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, Vietnam and the U.S., obviously, uh, Canada, Mexico, and Japan just said that they wanted to join. Now, this so is huge. This, this is, is huge. This, this is, is a... this is going to create the second largest trading block, putting all these countries together. So you're going to have over 500 million customers in one trading block. So think about, you know, if we could harmonize customs for this trading block, how much easier Jeez. would it be for you to sell? Um, you know, the benefits to the U.S., there's a great report out by uh, the Congressional Research Service on the TPP and, and what it means and what the benefits are. Uh, with Japan in the mix, it's going to be a $75 billion benefit uh, to the U.S. Just to the U.S.? Just to the U.S. Vietnam is, is also stands to gain probably the most uh, because it's got a very smaller economy. Its economy is okay. only $124 billion by comparison. But the $124 billion uh, economy stands to gain 35 billion from the TPP, and the TPP. What's what's extraordinary? We're calling this a 21st century 21st century trade agreement. Yes, you have the benefits of reductions in tariff lines. About 11,000 tariff lines will go to zero. Vietnam, when you look across all the TPP countries, has one of the higher tariff rates on average okay. between eight and nine percent. So if you're a you know you're a company in Hawaii and you're shipping to Vietnam, all of a sudden it's Eight or nine percent. It goes right to your bottom line. Right to your bottom line, or right to your distributor's bottom line. However, you split that difference. But beyond those kind of agreements, what makes this agreement so revolutionary, really revolutionary, and very exciting, is what it's trying to do on things like state-owned enterprises, or IPR, or customs. And let me just dig down a little bit on on the customs issue. Okay. Um, there again was a study to look at customs in terms of what. Uh, or logistics. What happened? Hold that thought for a second. Sure. The study, and and for for those of you listening to this, the customs issue is critical for American businesses because it, uh, you know, unless you're involved in services, if you're involved in goods, you got to have a way to get the goods uh, off the dock, so to speak. And in a lot of countries like Vietnam, there are severe challenges sometimes doing that in terms of both the paperwork as well as the corruption issue, which we'll get to later on in the program here. So now back to the study. Sure, and on that note, my team spends a lot of time working with customs of arbitrariness. Sometimes after you know shipping in a good for 12 years, the customs authority decides that, oh, we're going to put it in a different higher tariff uh, line item. And we spend a lot of our time getting stuff out of customs around the world. When I was in China, we also spent a lot of time mm -hmm. trying to deal with, as you say, right. some of the arbitrariness. But, but getting back to this study, if all the countries in TPP could get on two out of the four main processes of customs, one being what happens in terms of the form, an e-customs form, get harmonization on the e-customs forms, and if they could get their process at the border only up to halfway up to the world standard? Halfway. Just halfway. There would be a 7% increase in GDP worldwide. Wait a minute. Say that again. 7% growth rate just from customs. GDP worldwide. You mean, worldwide. You mean, you mean a country like Uganda would benefit? Well, the, the people in the uh, TPP. So right, the right, TPP. Right. Okay. So right. the TPP countries would benefit 7%. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. And uh, what if they were to go? F you 100%, right? What 100%. if we could go? Yeah, you know. Wow. Uh, it, it's remarkable, the, the benefits. So again, this trade agreement is remarkable in trying to address some of the underlining structural issues on state-owned enterprises. And a state-owned enterprise in, in many countries, for example, like China and Vietnam, you have companies that are set up by the government, and they tend to be monopolistic in nature. Um, they tend to be sort of the 60-pound gorillas in one sector. Um, banks, for example, in Vietnam are also state-owned enterprises. It's very difficult. Um, they're changing that. They're trying to equitize. They're trying to structure their, restructure their banking systems. But what this trade agreement does is try to level the playing field between private sector companies, and that includes the host country private sector, it's a benefit to them, and state-owned enterprises. So that would mean, for instance, in the case of Vietnam, you in the telecommunications sector, you have a company like 
like BNPT that has a, a, a virtual monopoly uh, over the, the internet, communication, so forth, you have a benefit to the, to the, the I don't know that there are any private companies in, the, in that field yet, but, but would open up to, to foreign competitors. Well, as well. And, and why this is also important is as, you know, some of, uh, for Vietnam, as some of its WTO commitments come into force, for example, another big one is on express delivery. As of January of this year, uh, foreign companies can have a wholly foreign-owned uh, express delivery service and have a license under, as a wholly foreign-owned enterprise. Up to then, they had to have a joint venture partner. So FedEx, FedEx no, is no, now, need, no, need, no need joint venture partner. No need to do a joint venture partner. So this becomes very important as some of the WTO commitments are phased in in a country like Vietnam. Generating a lot of opportunity. Generating for, a lot of opportunity for U.S. companies. And the other interesting thing is there's an SME, small and medium-sized enterprise, part of this negotiation of trying to develop infrastructure to really help small and medium-sized enterprises among these 12 countries. So there, there's a lot of new, new verbiage, a lot of new ideas being tried to be hashed out between, again, it's a difficult, it's 12 different countries discussing and trying to come to the table. You know, I, for, the, uh, for our audience out, out here, I, I want to mention uh, uh, one additional twist to what uh, Sarah has already uh, put on the table, which is a pretty big card. And that is the regional comprehensive partnership uh, mm -hmm. being negotiated now amongst the ASEAN countries. And that would be a free trade agreement between the ASEAN countries of Southeast Asia and China and India. Right. And that would mean, uh, for instance, uh, an American firm that develops a subsidiary in Vietnam then has free trade access through that subsidiary, subsidiary into China and into India as well as other ASEAN countries not a part of the TPP, which is huge, just huge. There, there's also coming online in 2015 is the ASEAN countries and their free trade agreement just within the ASEAN countries. And what they're trying to do is a single window, um, meaning one customs form, all 10 ASEAN countries. Uh, Vietnam is, is taking on the challenge of trying to do an electronics clearing. Um, which, you know, if they can, could do that again, if you can address the bottlenecks in the supply chain, everybody wins. So there's some, there's some interesting things happening. You know, this, in this context of becoming a regional player, uh, I'm sure folks in the audience, you can see that from the standpoint of these, these, this major, major trade uh, agreement being negotiated. But Vietnam is also becoming a major player in, in the diplomatic field and some other areas uh, to a limit, more limited extent. I mean, uh, haven't they been involved in, in some requests? Let's see, they sat on the United Nations Security Council for a while, and they also did uh, some training for peacekeeping, the United Nations and some other, other you know, beginning to sit on the world stage. And they're certainly taking on a somewhat of a leadership role within the ASEAN Secretariat and the ASEAN community as well. So Interesting. A regional player. We'll talk about the challenges when we come back after the break. Seven sixty KGU. Part of the Wall Street <laughs> Business Network. Like, I don't know if Just it. one new accident <laughs> is reported. It's in Manoa Valley on East Manoa Road at Oahu Avenue. Watch for malfunctioning traffic lights at North Kuakini and Lanikila Avenue, <laughs> and over on the windward side at Kahikili Highway and Kulakeoi Street. No problems it's coming over watching. from the windward side. From the east, the H1 Evabound slows at the Kapiolani Boulevard exit, and we have normal really? conditions coming in from the west. All right, men, let's talk prostate. Did you know a man's prostate continues to grow after <laughs> you reach the age of 25? Um, the older we get, the more problems we seem to come across. You know, Loss of sleep, there's some annoying trips to the bathroom in the middle the, uh, of the night, and worst of all, problems radio. in the old bedroom. So now that I have your attention, I'm going to clue you in on what can be done to help keep your prostate health in check. First, see your doctor for regular checkups. Second, start making beta prostate a part of your daily health routine. This all-natural supplement helps give your body the nutrients it needs to support 
prostate wellness. There have already been over 2 million bottles sold. Why? Because these proven nutrients target the prostate and help keep it healthy. Waking up at night for bathroom visits isn't fun. So be proactive and start taking care of your prostate today. Call now to get beta prostate risk-free. Call 1-800-816-9290. Be one of the first 50 callers and receive a free gift with your order. Call 1-800-816-9290. That's 1 800 And I'm sure he's taking care of all clearances. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, is also brought to you by Hawaiian Actually, Electric Company, powering the growth and development John, of Hawaii since it was chartered by King Kalakaua in 1891. So Today, Hawaiian Electric and its subsidiaries, CCS, Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light Company, serve more than 95% of our state, providing reliable electric service essential to our quality of life. The Hawaiian Electric Great companies are also leading our transition to clean energy by increasing our renewable energy use, and improving energy efficiency, we're reducing Hawaii's dependence on imported oil and in providing a more sustainable and secure future for Hawaii. <coughs> for more information, visit hawaiisenergyfuture.com. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, is also brought to you by the State okay, Energy Office of the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. How can we secure a better oh, future yeah. for Hawaii? One way is clean energy. And the state energy know office that. I just is know that steering Hawaii Gamble. to that clean energy future. Like, Hawaii is rich oh, with natural renewable love. resources, <laughs> the sun, the wind, the ocean, and the land. And they are all being tapped to meet Hawaii's clean energy initiatives to generate electricity, create jobs, spur economic growth, and reduce our dependence on imported foreign oil. To learn more, visit energy.hawaii.gov. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech Radio series here on AM 760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. We are back and we're talking about the business update with a very un most unusual country, uh, Vietnam. And to help us do that, our special guest is Ms. Sarah Kemp, the Senior Commercial Officer for the United States Embassy in Hanoi. And uh, if you've joined, just joined our program, uh, in the first uh, couple of sections, we talked a little bit about the Vietnamese economy and Vietnam's current relationship with the United States and its tightrope, unusual relationship that it has with China. And in the last segment of our show, we were talking about Vietnam becoming a regional player and this new Trans-Pacific Partnership coming up that's being negotiated, coming down the home stretch, right, Sarah? The, yep, uh, we hope so. Uh, Hopefully by the end of the year. 2013, maybe, uh, Japan joining and Vietnam in the mix. So, um, And now, Sarah, let's, let's shift topics here a little bit. Uh, you know, people, people are wanting to know a little bit. What are... What, Let's get into the challenges. Let's That's let's true. talk about some of the difficulties in doing business in in, uh, in Vietnam, and, and uh, not that it's impossible, but but there are some interesting interesting things there. In your mind, what what is the uh, the number one challenge for new business coming into Vietnam? You've got an entrepreneur who is driving home and uh, listening to this show here. So, if it's an exporter wanting to sell in, I would say the biggest challenge is finding the right partner and doing the due diligence to ensure that that partner is going to do things uh, above boards. Corruption is a huge problem. And this is an area of your expertise. And, you know, I had to ask you to jump in and, and talk well, a little bit. I'll help you part way, but i got to give you a chance oh, okay. <laughs> So one of them is just finding the right partner and knowing who, knowing enough about that partner. Um, if it's, uh, you know, if someone's driving home and they have operations and they're looking to set up and, and manufacture energy, uh, in, there is a lack of energy. There is a lack of consistent energy. Most of the manufacturing, certainly all the industrial states and most of the big manufacturers have to have their own backup generators because the energy supply is just not enough and it's, it's not stable enough. Well, why, why, let's, let me ask you this. Why is sure. that? Well, part of that is the way the energy sector is structured. The Vietnamese government subsidizes the energy tariff rate to 6.7%. It, or, or it controls the price. It doesn't really subsidize it. It just says you will... 6.7 cents. Cents for, for kilowatt, right? Okay. So 6.7 cents, which doesn't really make it a viable, bankable project. So if I want to come in and put in a, a coal plant or an oil 
uh, refinery, or, or even for that matter on the renewables, they do, they do up that to 7.8% for renewables, it, it still is not a high enough market-driven price to be able to be bankable. And so you have Electricity of Vietnam, who is the state-owned enterprise that, that is responsible for electricity uh, generation, uh, has to buy high and sell low. And so they're basically big. It doesn't really work. Doesn't really. Work. Now the good news is there is a master plan, master plan seven, um, and there is a plan to move towards a market-based pricing structure, uh, which is great. And and the you know the plan this year is to increase the price forty percent. So go from six point seven percent at forty percent. But really, the Vietnamese government is in this little bit of a bind where they they don't want to increase the price of energy to the local citizens. Um, they're very mindful uh, about what that's going to do to the poorer classes, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and they haven't quite dis developed a structure where you know there's one price for industrial and one price for consumers, or how do you subsidize consumers? Um, but they're they're working again. They're working towards a market, more of a market-based pricing structure. But until we're there, it makes doing energy deals very difficult. Well, that that's I guess that means that because of that pricing structure the country hasn't been able to build the capacity that it needs to sustain the growth. That's entirely correct. You've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, that does, however, mean that there's a lot of opportunities for companies that are in smart grid, for example. How do you get more out of the existing grid? Um, they're going to a smart grid. They're going to SCADA. How do you uh, prevent line loss, you know, electricity line loss? How do you extend the life cycle of the existing infrastructure? So, you know, if there are companies that have products that will help with that, then Vietnam definitely wants to see them yesterday. Uh, the other, I mean, interesting thing on infrastructure in general, I mentioned it before, 200 billion in overseas development assistance, World Bank, ADB. So there is some money. Um, unfortunately for the U.S., Japan plays very, very strongly in the energy field through JICA, their development assistance uh, organization. So there's a lot of Japanese project funding. So if companies have JVs with Japan, and we see more and more U.S. companies in the energy sector doing that, they're, they're playing in this sector. Okay. What other challenges exist uh, that you see in terms of sure. uh, American business coming into, uh, coming into Vietnam? So in terms of coming into Vietnam, I would, besides energy, the second biggest one is, is HR, uh, meaning just the human capital development. Um, Intel has this state-of-the-art factory that it's set up outside of Ho Chi Minh. It's a chip manufacturing, $1 billion investment. And when they first started, they went out and did a call for resumes. Okay. They got 1,000. 1,000 resumes. Four certified as qualified. And so what they had to do is they have developed a state of the art. I mean, this is a program on building capacity, engineer capacity, that has been touted by the Vietnamese government themselves. Every single ministerial meeting I'm in, everyone talks about what's called the HEAT program. Working with the USAID, the US government, University of Arizona and Intel, they developed a training program to train engineers uh, up to a level that then obviously are in the pipeline to be hired by Intel. So companies setting up have to build that into their cost structure that they're going to have to do a lot more training, a lot more um, human capacity building. And maybe more time spent finding the right people, recruiting. Ex and Yes, exactly. Exactly, although on the educational note, there are about 15,000, almost 16,000 students that come back to the U.S. each year to study. And so what we're also seeing now is, is some of the returnees um, coming back and taking on... A returnee, I love that term. Yeah. <laughs> well, the students the are coming back. <laughs> the other thing that we're seeing besides the students coming back is we're seeing sort of the second generation. So the, the kids that left maybe when they were 10. Okay. Uh, and are now in their 40s, 30s and 40s, are coming back as well and, and starting to set up. So the overseas Vietnamese community is also, um, we're seeing that sort of second generation coming back and becoming more involved. You know, one of the things, kind of remarkable things that Vietnam has done to, to bring its population into uh, almost almost sync with, with business possibilities or hiring, and I realize it's an education challenge, but it has been this poverty alleviation, which we didn't talk about before, but that's, that's brought a whole sector of the, the country in, into it, it really, I mean, it, it's remarkable. There, nothing short of remarkable, and Vietnam should get full credit 
uh, the poverty rate in the last 12 years went from 60 percent down to 15. I mean, that is just... It's mind-boggling. Oh. 90 million people, 60 percent down to 15. So you have this, this growing middle class, this growing po generally positive outlook on life uh, because of the incredible change and the in incredible increase in people's livelihoods that they've experienced. What else do you see in terms of challenges that, that businesses face sure. uh, in Vietnam? Bureaucracy. <laughs> a lot of bureaucracy. There Again, there is this great uh, World Bank report called The Ease of Doing Business, and it ranks all the countries around the world. And if, if you're interested, I highly recommend people to look at it because it's got a lot of very, very good information. But I'll, I'll just pull one little factoid. Okay. So it looks at taxes and, you know, how many... How many taxes does an average does a business have to pay, and how many man or people hours does it take to to fulfill that requirement? So for Vietnam, there are 32 different taxes that oh. a business entity is going to have to pay, and it takes on average something like 932 man or people hours. Um, when you look at the Asia standard or the average, on average it's it's something like 28 taxes and 234 people hours. So, um, Sounds to me like Vietnam needs to do a little improvement in this area. Of, uh, yeah, and, and I did pull that as an extreme example. There are some, some areas where Vietnam is, is outranking some of its neighbors, and, and that's what's very interesting. While Vietnam ranks 99 overall out of 168 countries. This is in, in overall ease of doing business. Ease of doing business. Okay. Yeah, and Malaysia uh, ranks above and Thailand ranks above. Indonesia and the Philippines rank below. But when you, t you go into the details, of what is what goes into that ranking yes energy is it Vietnam ranks very low 150 but in other things Vietnam ranks relatively high in terms of ease of getting a permit hmm. so it's a very mixed mag but bureaucracy in general there are there are lots of different uh, steps sometimes before we hit the break here uh, any other comments on the challenge side of things you know it's a it's a market for patience and persistence um, I served in mainland China for about 10 years, 11 years, and I've now been in Vietnam for about two. And I would say that in some ways Vietnam is a little harder. Um, it's a little more complicated because it's a consensus-based decision-making. Um, in, in China it was more a command and control, and if you could figure out who the key decision-makers were, it was easier to figure out how to get deals done. Vietnam, it's very much consensus-based, and you can go around and around you know, getting the prime minister to sign up, getting the ministers to sign up, and it, it's some in some ways it's very, very opaque. Even who the decision makers are. I've had cases where we've been working on projects, and all of a sudden we find there's a whole other ministry that we didn't even think about that somehow is now in the mix of having to okay. sign off on things. And of course, the challenge that you mentioned at the outset that will will if we should emphasize is is the corruption challenge. And can you talk a little bit about what you've seen? I mean, you've done some pretty historic and remarkable work on this. Well, it's 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 uh, Vietnam is a, a country where uh, business milieu where the corruption side is endemic and systemic, meaning it's everywhere, and uh, it it is it is uh, something that is a business can handle, but they need to have good expertise. Uh, good consultants and be very mindful of the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And, and uh, you just don't go in and play ball that way because you will be in trouble. Uh, but there are ways to manage it uh, and you can get there, but it's everywhere. And uh, stay tuned, we've got more. There is a way after the break. 760 KGU, part of the Wall Street Business Network. Just one new accident is reported. Yeah, it's in Manoa Valley on East Manoa Road at Oahu right. Avenue. Watch for malfunctioning traffic lights at North Kuakini and Lanakila Avenue and over on the windward side at Kahikili Highway and Kulake Oi Street. No problems coming over from the windward side. From the east, the H1 Everbound slows at the Kapilani Boulevard exit. And we have normal conditions coming in from the west. 
Imagine having coffee with one of the country's most successful financial advisors. He leans over and shares a brilliant business strategy that could save you a bundle on taxes. It's about to happen. Listen to what syndicated financial talk show host Ray Lucia has to say about LegalZoom.com. Online legal websites can be a nightmare, and going to an attorney is going to cost you. If you want to save big time on your taxes, you may want to incorporate. Please go to LegalZoom.com. Brilliant legal documents and real people to help all at a fraction of the cost of going to an attorney. Well, no, Incorporating you know, your business, huh? even home-based business is smart. Golden, golden Incorporating pipes, uh, through LegalZoom uh, is brilliant. You I'm see, sure LegalZoom others. isn't a law firm. They provide self-help services in your specific direction, so not only are your documents flawlessly prepared and filed <laughs> for you, you'll save about 85% of what a lawyer the, might charge. Uh, Visit LegalZoom.com and get a special discount by typing oh. bonus in the referral uh, box at checkout. Yeah. That's LegalZoom.com. LegalZoom.com. Think Tech well, always brings unparalleled well, media depth to its programs, and our show Asia in Review is no exception. The Thursday Asia Business and Foreign Policy shows here on Think Tech are hosted by David Day, a well-known international lawyer with extensive experience in the business and geopolitical issues of the Asia-Pacific region. Come join David as Think Tech illuminates Hawaii's bridge to Asia with fascinating and lively discussions, featuring experts who unwind the critical issues and then probe for the solutions. Asia in Review with David Day. Think Tech Hawaii is a Hawaii nonprofit corporation organized in the year 2000. Its purpose is to raise public awareness about the importance of technology, energy, agriculture, and globalism to the diversification and expansion of our economy. We do this by television shows on community television and on OC16, by newspaper articles, and by our Think Tech radio series on KGU 760 AM. We also do it by panel programs and events, including our monthly luncheon programs with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. Think Tech, working to raise public awareness in Hawaii. Check us out at thinktechhawaii.com. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech radio series here on AM 760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. Well, welcome back. This is the Wall Street Business Network, and we are talking about business updates, doing business in Vietnam, what's new. And our special guest in the studio with us is Ms. Sarah Kemp from the United States Embassy in Hanoi. And Sarah is the Senior Commercial Officer in Vietnam for the U.S. Commercial Service. Uh, and <clears throat> if you just joined our program, we were talking right before the break about some of the challenges that uh, U.S. business faces in Vietnam, and right at the break we were talking on, about the serious challenge of, of uh, corruption in the country. And, uh, so Sarah, what is it that, that your operation, the U.S. Commercial Service, how do you get involved in this, this challenge? Uh, so part of what's uh, critical for U.S. companies to do, and, I, and this is one of your, what you said before we went on break was, you really need to do your due diligence. What, some of the things that we do is we offer a, a, what we call an international company profile. Many of the big companies use it as part of their due diligent process to know who they're doing business with, trying to get at that. The other thing that we do is um, we oftentimes get involved in projects just to lay a marker down that we're interested and we're following it. Uh, we're, we're, we're very in, we want to know what's going on. And we relay that to the host government, to the Vietnamese government, or to, in some cases, it's not even the government. It might be a private sector project, and we send letters. Well, or just, just the fact that you, that, that, that we, we're taking you're an interest. In taking an interest. Taking an interest. Um, and I would add, I would turn this back at you. You've done some very interesting work. What do you tell some of your clients? You've had some very interesting experiences in this. Well, related to the point that you just said, you know, that if if um, if I am suspicious. Uh, which happens in every single case that that uh, one of my clients is going to get hit with with uh, some kind of request for a bribe. One of the things I want to make sure I do is is get the embassy and the U.S. Commercial Service on my side to do to make those phone calls or write those letters that you just talked about. And the reason is that's kind of like throwing a little a little blanket. It's an insurance policy. And then there's a there's a parallel to that, and that is that that. That if your your consultant or advisors have the right relationship with the Vietnamese government, if you can get the Vietnamese government to do the same thing, if you have the 
the right connections to get them to say, hey, this is a favorite favorite project of the minister or the deputy minister, and uh, they want you to look after these Americans. Um, so those are the, the, the two uses of the two governments. Um, but in addition to that, we always have to remember that uh, residents, citizens of the United States are subject to the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, whether or not they're in a uh, company registered with the SEC or they're in a small private company or whether they're operating on their own. And there are serious fines and criminal penalties for uh, getting caught bribing at least public right. officials. And uh, I think you're the one that, that and told me I, I wasn't aware that under the Obama administration there's been more cases brought uh, by the Department of Justice and there's been more actual jail time served by U.S. citizens or CEOs or company executives than in past. That's right. And uh, con connected with that are some very, very substantial fines uh, in in some cases in the hundreds of millions of dollars and so you know you, that's almost backbreaking for a multinational so this this area of corruption Americans have to handle this very carefully and uh, you know one of the ways that we do this is to use the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act the law as a shield mm. get the US Embassy Sarah Kemp and her operation to back us and then the other thing is to, to understand that it's it's okay to say no. And I think that, you know, what's your, what's your feeling about this? Aren't the, the Vietnamese are getting more and more used to dealing with Americans and they're expecting that no, so they don't push quite as hard as they did. I, I, would, I would agree with that. I think it's, it's fairly well known that Americans just don't play that game. Um, but, but as you said, companies have to be willing to walk away from deals. Um, because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's not an okay defense to say I just didn't know what was happening, right? In terms of oh, the foreign corrupt uh, yeah, practices. Yeah, yeah, there's going to have to be some real reasonable proof there that, uh, that uh, you really had no reason to know. And they're going to look into that very carefully. And so you better do your due diligence and you better do your homework and you better have your accounting and records and, you know, where this money went and what with receipts and all that, and so it's very dangerous. And the other good news is it's not just the, the U.S. has the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, but I also understand that England or Great Britain has also thrown in with its own version of the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, which is equally as stringent, and, and so now there is at least a growing, uh, growing body. It's not just the Americans oh, anymore. Oh, yeah, it's not just the Americans, and the, and the <coughs> British version is actually uh, a lot more stringent, uh, and, and we don't have time to get into that, but... but but Maybe on another show. On another show, we'll do that. But, you know, this, th there are some ways of doing business in Vietnam to be successful. And there don't are. let this discussion that Sarah yes. and I are having discourage you. I mean, yes. I, let's, let's start with the, the, the kind of the step one. You've got a new small business, maybe located here in sure. Hawaii or on the U.S. mainland, and they want to get into the, to the, to the Viet, Vietnamese market. So how do they, how do, they do, do, do How do they do that? Thank you for that question. So I'm going to give everyone who's maybe driving home and who is in Hawaii a phone number that they're going to call, and it's going to connect them to an unbelievable trade expert named John Holderman, who is our person here in Hawaii. It's 522-8041. I think you misread your notes. It's Holman. Holman, sorry. John Holman. 522-8041. And really, that's the first step. Figuring out what market do you start, Wait, start what, with. If I call that number and I get a hold so of you this get guy, Holman, and who is he? What's he, he going to do? So he is uh, he's part of the Foreign Commercial Service. He is our domestic specialist. His job is to help companies identify what's the right market. And he's he can connect them with my counterparts around the world. So not just me in Vietnam, but we're in 80 countries overseas. We have teams on the ground overseas that help a client. So for example, John has sent me a client. Um, what I will do is I will look at the product materials, do a, a basic SWOT analysis, what, what does this work for the market? And if we think it works for the market, we'll set up a phone call with that company to try to say, okay, what are your objectives? What's your timelines? What do, what do you need? You're looking for an agent distributor? Tell me specifically what criteria you're looking for, what technical um, requirements or expertise they need to have. Obviously, they need to speak English. What are you looking for? And then my team will go out and try to find that for them. And this is the marriage broker function that we talked this, about at the beginning of the show is. here. This is a very, very uh, priceless 
asset that exists for Americans who know about this. Well, and I'm glad you said priceless because while it is, the value is priceless, we do we do charge a small cost recovery fee for for some of the work if if uh, you know a company oh, yeah, wants that, to pursue. That is, that is almost de minimis. It is almost de minimis. But it is invaluable, and and there are we've had a lot of successes. I mean, I know I've, we've sort of painted a little bit of a discouraging picture with with some of the challenges. Well, we're trying to paint an honest picture, though. That's yes. what's important. That's true. But there are a lot of opportunities. We've seen a lot of opportunities in uh, IT, software development. Um, this summer we, we, we brought back the CTOs of all the banks and uh, took them around the U.S. to show them how banking is done in the U.S. And out of that we were able to get some, some small, some big U.S. companies some contracts on helping in the banking sector. Education. And Hawaii's got some great educational institutions. Again, there's about 15,800 students that come from Vietnam to the U.S., making Vietnam number eight in the world, but number two for community colleges in terms of number of students. Interesting. So number there's two. Number, number two, two in community yeah, colleges. I didn't know that. Wastewater, water purification. Uh, again, ADB and World Bank, there's some great projects. Uh, many times our small and medium-sized companies aren't the ones that are going to go after the big projects, but they're going to want to know who's bidding on the project so they can have their equipment sold into that product. So we, we work on that. Franchising, fast-moving consumer goods, there's lots of opportunities. Well, you know, it's been uh, wonderful to have spend this time with you, Sarah. Thank you Thanks for, for having me. To Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech Radio Series here on AM760 KGU with your host, David Day. You can learn more about Think Tech and listen to early 